right, we're going to jump in right to our next speaker. Um, uh, our next speaker is Tim Humphrey. Again, his credentials speak for themselves as well. Uh, Tim has been with GE for over 15 years and has over 30 years of experience in a variety of industry, ranging from oil and gas, aerospace, automotive, and pharmaceuticals. Tim recently launched the first digital inspection product in GE Oil and Gas and has been leading the charge at GE with regard to big data. So today he'll be speaking to us about what big data means for his company and what they've learned as they've traveled down the big data path. Join me in welcoming Tim Humphrey. Good morning. I, um, I, I want to thank you for the chance to be here and, and I, uh, I'm really kind of honored to be here and talking about this. I've been I wouldn't say necessarily leading the charge in big data, but trying to find ways to use it in our business. Because um, I can honestly tell you in GE, Jeff Immelt uh, and Bill Rue, the two leaders of the business, are driving this transformation in our company. And so when I, when I was asked to come here and speak today, I, I thought, well, how do you get in a room full of people from diverse backgrounds and diverse industries and, and not bore them to death with all the things that I find interesting about big data? <clears throat> so what I thought I would do is I would just talk to you about my journey over the last 18 months in creating a product. Um, oh, thank you. And, and launching and try, trying to utilize big data. So I, I thought I would just wind the clock back a little bit since I said I had 30 years experience. And, and I'll tell you, a few years ago, and I don't know how many of you are using big data, but a few years ago I started hearing about big data, right? And there's another one, oh, it's big data, big data, you gotta do something about big data. And, uh, Interestingly, I graduated from college with an electrical engineering degree in 1987, electrical and computer engineering, and from a university in upstate New York where my class was actually the first class in, in the country where every one of us went through school with a, with a PC on our, on our desks. Um, so I literally have been using a PC to do my homework since I started college, which is a long time ago. And that computer did not even have a hard drive. So big data to me back then was when I got like my first 10 megabyte hard drive. And you're like, ooh, I don't have to swap disks anymore. And I thought, you know, so here I've been on this data journey my whole life. And I thought, what is big data? I mean, I use data every day. I, I pour through gobs of spreadsheets. I look at SAP. Uh, I look at an MRP system. We are just constantly flooded with data. So I really saw this kind of skeptically. And I said, hey, you know, big data is just, some way for some consultant somewhere to brand this thing, slap a name on it, write a book, try to charge me a bunch of money. So I started to do what I do as an engineer and as a business person and as a, as a manager. I said, well, I, I better figure out what this is just in case. So I started researching and I thought I would kind of walk you through sort of what I, I learned. The, the, the first thing that I really got to figure out and the final conclusion I made here is, and if all of you haven't figured this out, I hope one takeaway you'll see today is that this is significantly different. We are not talking about large file sizes sent from that person who loves to attach a huge file that clogs up your email system and you can't send emails until you go get yourself out of email jail. And I don't know whether all of you suffer from that, but in GE, without review, we get stuck with it all the time. And that person is like, oh, they attached them in the, in the meeting notice and I've got to go dig it out now. So I am talking about something radically different. And and on a scale that I don't think we have even contemplated until the last few years. So I, I thought I'd take a, a moment, let's talk a little bit, right? Maybe a little bit of data about big data and what's really changing. So in 1992, they say the world generated 100 gigabytes of data a day. And, in, and it's estimated in 2018, we're gonna generate 50,000 gigabytes of data per second. And that is an astonishing number. And you just think, what, what are we doing with all of this? And I, I think um, Pamela, before me speaker, she did a great job of talking about one of the, some of the things they're doing. Another one that I think is staggering and what is really the, the start of all of this is that in 1960, there were only three billion people on Earth. And, and today, there are three billion people on the internet. And over like, a, I've, I've read numbers that say, a, quarter or a third of all humanity today is connected to the internet. A quarter of all people are actually on Facebook. Um, the other one that I think is fascinating, so I clocked this from when I graduated from college in 1987. And if you look at the total amount of data generated between 1987 and 2016, 
90% of it happened in the last two years. And, and it is just, it is accelerating at a rate, I, I, I think that is just unbelievable. And it just presents tons of opportunity. So I thought I'd try to get that, right? So you talk about these big numbers and zettabytes of data. A zettabyte of data, um, they say in 2011, the world had collected and categorized 1.8 zettabytes of data. And I honestly said, well, now we're just making up stuff, right? It's a gazillion bytes of data. Like, and so they're literally having to create new words to talk about how big this really is. And, and a zeta, so I said, well, how, you got to get some context here, right? I'm a, I'm a physical being. I want to see it in, in scale and size. And in 2016, and I've yet been able to confirm this, but early in 2016, they were saying that the world would generate a zettabyte of data in that year alone. So 2016 was said to be the year of the zettabyte. So I haven't quite figured that out. I don't know if it's true yet, but I'm guessing it probably is, and we'll talk about why here as we go along. But if you were to take one, two zettabyte of data, it would fill up 58 billion 32 megabyte iPads. And if you stacked all those up, it's literally enough iPads to build the Great Wall of China at twice its height. I mean, that is just staggering. And, and I just think it helps to put that. I, I've seen another thing where it talks about making it in terms of the volume of liquid. It's, and it always, we always seem to want to relate everything to the Great Wall of China. Um, I think just because it's so huge and it's, you know, it gives us all that wow. How many people in this room have actually ever been to China? Oh, quite a few. And if you've never been, I, I would suggest it. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing place to see. So, so where then is all of this data coming from? Oh, sorry. OK, so a lot of the data today is really coming from people being connected to the internet. It's video streaming, video files, pictures, you know, all the stuff that we feel like we need to share every single millisecond of our lives with our friends on Facebook and Instagram. And, uh, every other way we can kind of tell everybody what we're doing every second and tweeting and yelping and so a lot of that all that data is really most of the data is, is coming from people but what we think about at GE and what we're thinking about I think in general in industry and business is the internet of things and how many people have actually heard of the internet of things okay this is an abnormally educated room or informed room because Statistics I've read said eight, only 87% of people actually have really ever heard of it. So I assume since this is a data conference, most of you have. But if you think about who hasn't, it, it, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are still trying to figure out what this actually is about. So just some statistics here about the Internet of Things. And, and, and I'll give you some other details here, why I think this is happening, the opportunities this presents. It's estimated by 2020 there will be somewhere between 50 and 200 billion devices connected to the internet. And in 2008, they say that there was one device, or we exceeded the number of devices connected to the internet, this exceeded the number of people. But by 2020, it's supposed to be 26 times that. So we are connecting things to the internet together and collecting data um, in, in ways that I don't think anyone ever anticipated or, or expected. So, and, and I, I mean, you can read some of the statistics, but we at GE, we believe that this is 10 to $15 trillion worth of GDP by 2020, maybe a little bit past that, but, and that there'll be by 2020, $1.7 trillion of spending on the, the Internet of Things. So it's certainly an opportunity, and, and the value there is not in the connection of things, it is what you can learn from those things. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the Internet of Things, because we, we are investing here, we're thinking about this, and I see this happening everywhere. Um, what is it that drives this, and what's driving this transformation to big data, and what's driving the Internet of Things? And there's a host of things, right? Obviously, computing, computing power, and, and what we can do with computers today uh, definitely enables that, because we can just process more information. Miniaturization is one, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of years in GE Aviation, and anytime you want to put anything on a jet engine, it, <laughs> it's worse than an act of Congress. It's, it's huge. It, you can't add an ounce to an airplane easily. Every ounce counts, even when they talk about how much the paint weighs on an airplane. So when we want to add things to an engine, it's, it's huge. The GE NX engine 
has between 250 and 300 sensors on it. And that, that engine in a 12-hour flight can generate around 10 terabytes of data. But with the changes and the advancements that have been going on, Pratt & Whitney actually built an engine over the last few years called the geared turbofan. That engine has 5,000 sensors on it. And it generates 800 terabytes of data in a 12-hour flight. Put two of those on every airplane. The backlog of that engine is 7,000 engines. And you can, th they will generate zettabytes of data on their own with that one engine. That's one engine from one company out of GE, Rolls-Royce, and, and the amount of data they're collecting. Now, the only way to do that, and the only thing that makes things like that possible is miniaturization of sensors they have, and the ability to put them. And innovation in sensing technology is, it enables us to put sensors on things that you hadn't been able to do before, connect them. You got to get rid of wires, so wireless technology is critical. Cloud computing is essential. Robotics, so that we're actually doing things with machines, and then we can monitor everything that machine does. Um, and I'll give you another interesting statistic I, I just learned. I've learned over like the last 10 years, the cost, and you, we talk about automation, and you hear about automation all the time, but the cost of robotics and the deployment of robotics in the last 10 years has dropped by 50%, where the cost of labor has increased 80%. So it's easy to see why automation becomes a solution. It's just the cost is getting less and the cost of labor is more. It becomes just economics. So connectivity, obviously, I mentioned is one. The economics of this certainly drive it. The opportunity is huge. Uh, the thing we talk about, and I'll, I'll hit here next, is, is about productivity. Um, people in general, I think, are driving this. this there's this desire to consume more data. Everyone today is far more capable being connected. Um, so I think we've just gotten to that point where we want to be able to grab our phone or grab whatever iPad tool we use and instantly see that thing. So we want that kind of connectivity. So I think the demand for it is there. And, and then I think just wireless technology in general. We can connect everything wirelessly and Bluetooth. And um, there, there's so many wireless protocols with Zigbee and Six Lopan and Wihard. Just the ability to connect things is is really significant here, and it just keeps driving us forward. So, so then I said, okay, well, that's all interesting stuff. And there's lots of data, I get it, it's huge, I get it. Um, but what does that really mean, right? Because I'm a business person, and we, we, we run a company, and we care about this because we want to obviously find the value in it. So the value, just potential impacts that, that have been studied and analyzed in aerospace, it's estimated just 1% or 2% of productivity gain could be worth almost over $600 billion. And in automotive, it's, an, it's estimated to be about $700 billion. And uh, electricity, they say, with better efficiency distribution management, $1.3 trillion. Um, healthcare, I, just improving a little bit and, and listening to her this morning, I think it's probably bigger than this, but certain efficiencies that we think about in terms of operating the hospital, $400 billion. So it's, the opportunity is huge, right? And you obviously can't get to a $200 billion thing overnight, but, but it's there and it's real and all of the analytics of simple analytics of productivity would tell you these numbers are, are, are real. Um, but the other thing is that I think is really significant. Um, only a half a percent of all the data generated today is actually truly used and analyzed. So we are sitting on a gold mine. Uh, this is like mining. You know, you're, you're digging for ore here, and you've got to go through a lot of dirt to get to that stuff. But we are truly sitting on a gold mine of data in the world today, and, and we're producing more of it. Um, 75% of all companies today say they know that this is an opportunity and a need and that they have to act on it. But Accenture would estimate that only 85% of any company has actually started to realize the value of it. And the other one that is significant and, and complex in, in a new way is that 90% of all big data is actually unstructured. So it is video files. It's, it's just a, a mass of data. So extracting information from unstructured data and doing something to visualize that and find a way to learn something from that is a challenge. And, and so I started thinking about, so what, how do you do this? How do you tap into this? So, um, and, and well, sorry, one more point. Productivity, what we talk about in GE is productivity. We want to be, be more productive ourselves, and we want to help our customers be more productive. And when you look and study productivity, there is a 
stagnation of productivity gains in developed economies today, globally. So but for years, between 96 and 2005, typical productivity gain was 3%. And that's big, right? Any company, if you're gaining 3% productivity a year, and, and you're being more profitable. Um, world economies grow, right? The world advances when we, when we get more productive. And over the last four to five years, productivity has been a half a percent in developed economies. So the, the world needs a leap forward in productivity. And we are investing in, that, in, in PREDICTS, our, our operating system for the industrial internet. We are leveraging and using that to try to, to look at this big data. What can we do with it? And how do we help the world leap forward in productivity? And in fact, if you really study the statistics, over the last year or two years, the, the US, for the first time in 30 or 40 years, has actually seen a decline in productivity, um, which I, I find amazing, given, given all of the technology we have and how this was supposed to make all of our lives easier and better. Um, and, and I don't know how 400 emails a day necessarily makes me more productive, and maybe that's the solution, right? Reduce email, and we'll all be more productive. Um, but. I do think it's significant, and I think there, there's tremendous opportunity there. When you just talk about the convergence of all of these, of, of all of these forces and all of this data, it's, it's finding the value in there that's going to enable this. So I, I started thinking about this, right? And I go, okay, now I'll go back to the one I used to be. I was a Six Sigma master black belt, and we always use data. We use data to gain insights. The insights lead us to actions. The actions lead us to improve. It's just a constant PDCA cycle of improvement. We do it every day. And I thought, well, what is big? So big data, what does that really do, right? Well, it's much different, right? And the truth is the world is faced with huge problems today. Social, economic, environmental, business, it's, they're, they're, the problems just get bigger. They get bigger. They get more global. Everything is more complex. So I don't think it's all that different. I don't think the process has fundamentally changed. I just think it's bigger. Bigger data, bigger insights, bigger actions, bigger improvements, solving bigger problems. I, I think it's just what do we do? There's no, people still have to find the solution. People just need the information, and we got to help them find in that sea of data the insights that are going to help them make those huge improvements. I, I, I don't think it's... It, Anybody has to do anything right. We're not going to change as, as a society, but we can definitely do bigger things. But here's the thing that I really got to. Now, in my business, we collect a lot of data. Our job, I mean, we run an NDT business, and we collect data from a lot of sources. It's what we call healthcare for industry. So we're studying assets that customers use with ultrasound, with x-ray, with eddy current, with chirography, lots and lots of technology. And we always say, well, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And my lesson with big data, and given that 90% of that data is unstructured, is, is it really like finding a needle in a haystack? Because I think it's more like finding a needle in 10,000 haystacks. Because you are talking about data on a huge scale scattered all over in an unstructured way. So then we started to actually process and do some of these things. And, and the conclusion I really came to is that that's not the issue. Sorry, let me get to the next page here. The real issue is that it's not a field of haystacks. It's not 10,000 haystacks. And we always talk about comparing apples and oranges, but that's exactly what we're doing. We're not just comparing apples and oranges. We're comparing apples, oranges, sticks, rocks, hay, salt, whatever you want. And whatever anybody can collect, we then have to find a way to fuse that data, analyze it, visualize it, and find the value in it. So it's way more complicated than a needle in a haystack. We are, we are way past that in big data. Um, I would say that when I used to do this on a manufacturing problem with Six Sigma, that was a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. But this is a, this is a level of complexity um, infinitely harder to do. So I thought I would just walk you through what we did. Because I think the thing in this is it's big and it's daunting. And since we're standing here in Steelers country, and despite the fact that I grew up in New York, I've actually been a Steelers fan my whole life, way back to the Iron Curtain and Franco Harris. And <laughs> so I, I just grew up. I like, I guess, the rough and tumble nature of it. And I, I, so I was always a fan. But, and I thought I'd talk about a problem that has become something really near and dear to my heart over the last two years, and that is corrosion. And 
And we'll talk about another Pennsylvania native and Ben Franklin, right? Ben Franklin said one time that um, nothing is sure in life but death and taxes. And as I started to study the problem of corrosion, fundamentally corrosion is simply the interaction of metal with the external environment that creates a chemical reaction and the material decays. So I think you can add a third thing to Ben Franklin's list, and that is metal corrodes. It cannot be stopped. There are three ways you attack it. You either eliminate it, you find ways to mitigate it, and you measure, monitor, and help customers manage it. That's it. So metal is going to corrode. And here we are in the steel city. And you know what? You put stuff all over the world. No matter what you do, it's going to rot. Now, do we really care about that? Sure, my car rusts this at. We recently heard of incidents in like Flint, Michigan, where the water pipes corroded and there was lead and people guys think it's horrible, right? So corrosion can, can be a huge problem. And you hear about a pipeline leak where thousands of gallons of oil spilled or a refinery blew up or a tank exploded. You know, the NDT industry was actually invented to monitor assets where there's high consequence of failure. And high consequence of failure means to us human loss of life, major environmental damage, or huge economic loss. So anything like a jet engine or an oil pipeline or a refinery and any type of critical asset that needs to be monitored. And when you look at the impact of corrosion and the cost of corrosion, whether it's a spill or any other thing, it's $2.2 trillion globally. 3.5% of global GDP is driven by corrosion. So and you know, at GE, we like to say we, you know, we like to take on the world's toughest challenges, and this is clearly one of them. So it feels pretty daunting and pretty big. And I mean, it's a huge problem, and there's lots of complexity and a million ways to solve it. So we said, well, let's just pick one thing. How do you get started with data? We took one product. Our, one of the products we make is a thickness gauge. And people go out and collect, literally at a refinery, hundreds of thousands of measurements manually every year. Over 95% of all thickness measurement done on pipes in refineries today is done manually. So we developed a product with a new technology, a new, started with the sensor, and said, well, we want to install those all the time so nobody needs to be running around collecting 100,000 points of data and manually collecting it. And by the way, today, almost all of that data is actually still recorded on paper. So if you think the digital transformation has happened, you can think again. There is paper everywhere. And they, they literally have to go pull files to look at the history of what happened. They can't do really any analytics with it. So our first step was let's convert internal general corrosion to a continuously monitored sensor so that we can tell customers how fast that pipe wall is eroding. That's it wirelessly transmit that data back through the cloud into a, pre a predix generated app and provide them services, monitoring services, and all of that. That's it. That's the product. One type of corrosion, one sensor. Let's get started. And that was it. We picked a point and began. And, and the demand for this has been unbelievable. And we've already found examples just in the first six months that we've been in the market with this that customers have been able to extend assets for three months, four months, because now they know exactly how thick that thing is at any point in time. They can make process adjustments and say, well, let's run something different or do something different to help extend the life of that till we get to an outage in our facility. So this is not just about the criticality. We've now been able to fuse that with process data and help customers advance. So it's a really exciting product. And it was just interesting for us because we said, well, we, we didn't know how to begin. And how do you do a digital transformation? Well, we said, you know, we just got to pick one product and let's go drive it. So I would just tell you what we did and where we've been going is we started collecting data and we just started learning. Um, the next thing, I just think, so then we've got to there, right? Now, what I've learned as I've gone through this and as we launched it is big data presents a whole new host of problems. Storage of that data. Um, management of it, communication of it. Security is one that constantly comes up. We started pushing this data to the cloud, and we didn't even give customers an option. We just said, it's a cloud solution. And I think the cloud has tremendous value. And, and I don't know how many of you agree or disagree or find it valuable, but for, for us, I think from an operating perspective for customers, the cloud is an incredibly valuable because your software is always there, always live, up to date, and you don't have to try to maintain software versions on 10,000 computers. It's just everybody has access to the most current thing all the time. 
So we didn't went to that way. And it's been a struggle for customers because they're not used to that. The other thing we did was we converted it to a data ingestion-based model, a consumption-based model. So we stopped selling customers hardware and we started selling them what we believe is really valuable. We started selling them the data. But that's a challenge. It's, an op it's a conversion from a capital expenditure model to an operating expense model, which is hard for customers to all take. It gives you this kind of ongoing revenue stream. It's good for us. Um, I think actually it's cost-wise probably cheaper for them in the end, but it's a conversion and it's a way of thinking they need to change. Um, passing data through the cloud and the absolute fear of, of hacking. I mean, we've spent the last several months listening about hacking, so obviously hacking is on everybody's mind, but it's real and it's a problem. And um, you know, we're investing a ton in trying to help solve the hacking issues and data security issues. And for our product, we said, you know, it's pretty innocuous data, it's thickness data. You're not moving anything, right? It's pretty safe. Let's get customers comfortable with something that we can convert that way that, that isn't terrifying. Like, you know, I don't, I don't need a valve actuating because someone hacked in. I, I can't, that's scary, and, it, and it, it is. So we said, let's validate security with a product that can't really do any damage. The other one, and I think uh, Pamela this morning showed exactly what I was talking about here in that. When we started analyzing all this data and when we look at it in aggregate and when you put it together, the whole new way of looking at it, when you measure everything and track everything and you have temperature data and position data, when you man all what she was showing this morning is exactly why big data is incredibly valuable. You find and see things that there's no other way to see. You just, you can't do it on paper and you can try to talk to people. And you know, I've actually learned when you actually talk to people, some of the insights you see in big data are there. And they say it, but we don't always really register it. But the data does validate it. And sometimes it opens your eyes and you just go, what's going on there? And it's, it's amazing. So the visualizations and the analytics I think is the next wave of innovation and transformation that's coming. And, um, I, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but it's exciting to see what it's already been doing. And, and when you start to try to fuse all different forms and types of data, how you manage it and analyze that is, is hard. So that's what we're trying to do is create a set of tools on a product that will help customers and companies from any industry be able to do that. So just a few things, kind of my lessons learned, right? Big data, it is here to stay. And it, it is... Um, I would tell you it's emerging today. We talk about it like it happened, but when you really look at what's going on, this has not happened. We're collecting it, but we don't know how to use it. We're barely using any of it. We haven't figured out entirely how to unlock the value of it, but it is definitely real, and it is definitely an opportunity, and I think any business has to be looking at it. Um, I also think it's daunting and huge, and you don't know all the answers, and you're not going to, so start somewhere. Um, there's just opportunity everywhere. Um, one big lesson I had on this one as well, I would tell you, you cannot do this alone. There are too, it's too complicated and there's just too many moving pieces. There's too much stuff to figure out. Um, you have to ask for help. You gotta have partners, you gotta collaborate. You gotta get into stuff like open innovation and let other people help you because it's just, there's no way. I just don't think any one company can do this alone. So find the people that can partner with you. And I think if you look, you know, this is culturally, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about GE here. Culturally, we are a company that always wants to do everything ourselves. We have a huge not invented here thing. And it is hard to overcome that. And you can see this being driven at the very top layers of the, of the company. We are just looking for where we can partner, collaborate, pull people into this, build an ecosystem, not try to build our own solution. And it's a different way of thinking, and it's hard. And if you're, we're, a, we're an engineering company, we're an operating company, you know, we're proud. And, and we like to say, hey, this, we invented this thing. And we're having to let go of some really long-held beliefs. And so that is the one thing I would tell you that I think when you get to the end of this and, and ask yourself some questions. Um, is this is a world of possibility here. Um, when I, I went through... 150 years of innovations over the last few days, just thinking about this, just for this talk. And you start talking like, okay, you know, you hear these things, oh, we put a man on the moon, right? There's, there's a long, 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 long list. And I was looking at, I was more concerned about how fast it happened and started to look at, well, okay, from what the time 
Franklin discovered electricity to when the first power plant was built to where we are today and how much we take electricity for granted. That was a pretty long time. But it, the first flight in Kitty Hawk was in 1903. We put a man on the moon in 1969. That was pretty fast. I mean, all things considered, I would say that's pretty fast. Um, we ended, ended, invented the telegraph in 1831. We began trying to communicate in 1831 by some electronic means. And in 1973, it was the first mobile phone. And now I'd be surprised if everybody doesn't have at least one. How many have two? That's fewer than I thought. Um, but I, I, so what I, what I say, right, I look at this and I'm like, what do, what do people always say? We put a man on the moon and we accomplished all we've done as humanity with less computing power than you have in your hand today. And now we have m massive amounts of data and we're figuring out new and better ways to do things. I don't think that we have ever stood at the edge of a time in history when there was more possibility and more potential and more things that we're gonna be able to do. And, and I think it's rare in this world to be at a point like this. This is, a, this is really, to me, a, a point that we are going to look back in, in 50 years, some of you. I'm not sure where I'll be looking from, but hopefully <laughs> somewhere, um, and say, wow. I cannot believe the problems we were able to solve based on the data that we now have. And I think that's significant. So I can, I can try, and I said uh, I can take some questions, but I, I think what, I, what I've learned in big data is I always seem to end up with more questions. It's like ripping into an old house. Um, every time I started doing something, I'm like, wow, there's five more problems I need to solve and five more things I need to figure out. So I tend to end up with more questions than answers, but I, I would give you some questions and, uh, and think about this, right? Where, what really truly is changing in your industry? Where's your industry going to be 10 years from now because of, of digital and big data? And I, I would ask you, where are you on, where is your industry on the digital journey, right? A lot of this has been, I mean, we certainly have learned how to shop better and easier, and we can just get stuff to our house all the time. That's great, but it's going to change industry in, in even bigger ways than it has changed our personal lives. Um, and then I would ask, where are you? You should ask yourselves, where are you on this digital journey? And where are you in relation to the industry? And you really have to be honest because you could fool yourself. And it's moving so fast. If you think you're ahead, you're not going to be ahead for long. And if you stand still, you're really going to get behind. Um, but I also think you've got to look at the potential. You know, I, I talk about this a lot, right, and when I, when as I run a business. People always want to come to me and they talk to me about my competitor. Oh, Olympus, our competitor, our competitor, our competitor. I don't think it's your main competitor that's the one that's going to knock you out of business unless you really blow it. You know how to compete with your competitor. But what you don't know who to compete with is the person that shows up out of nowhere with a whole new way of doing it that absolutely makes you obsolete. So you've got to look at threats way outside of where you're normally thinking today because someone's going to make you irrelevant and they're going to do it with data. And and I also think you got to look at the organization. Do we even ha are we structured for this? Do we have the skill sets for this? Do we have the do we have the capabilities and capacities we need? Um, she was talking this morning about data scientists. I mean, <laughs> right? Who would have ever thought that'd be one of the most important people in the company, right? So I'm, me, I used to be. I'm. I guess I'm always going to be a nerd, but. I was an engineer, and it was always in the old days, right? Just you know, put them in the room, do your engineering thing, and God, please don't talk to anybody, um, right? I mean, what do they always say about engineers, right? An outgoing engineer is the one that looks at your shoes instead of his own. Um, so, <laughs> so I think today, right? Here's these poor little nerdy data scientists that now have to sit out there and actually drive companies forward and, and do something interesting with all this data. It's um, it's amazing how this is changing the world. And I would just say, like, what's your first step, right? Ask yourselves, where can we begin and where can we get started? So thank you very much for your attention. I have answer all the questions you want. All right. Do we have any questions out there for Tim? And based on the questions you had earlier, I'd say, oh, no, no, you're good. I don't have any time. <laughs> you guys are a smart group. We have, a, we have a question over here. Thank you for, for doing this and from a manufacturer standpoint, which is the world I live in, it's, it's always nice to hear about big data. But yeah. also the scary part of it is the, the unrealized potential of that data, which you hit upon, whether it's unstructured or not, which has its own sort of technology 
gathering challenges. What would you suggest is the way to really accelerate that legacy of the, the culture of the manufacturer that if it isn't broken and my product line's working, you know, you talk about standing still, we all know that. But to push that from the top to the bottom, or really maybe from the bottom up, is really where I'm looking at, because a lot of that data is in those sensors or on the clipboard that could become the sensor. How do you really get that team that's in that line of manufacturing stuff to really help accelerate this message that the data they have and what they know as subject matter experts should be valued and sort of put that human quality onto the data? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, so I, I think a few things. Number one, I think a huge chunk of this data in industry is unutilized simply because of that exact challenge. And I would just tell you from what I've seen, this is very hard to do from the bottom up. Because you, you just don't have access to everything. You need help. Um, I think there has to be a desire at the top to say we are going to make a digital transformation. We are going to find a way to value data. And it's got to be an initiative that people from the top believe in, ask. I mean, if you, if you go back to the fundamental belief that people, you know, what gets measured gets done. Are we measuring the value of how we're, we're working with data? Are we measuring data? So if, for example, like when, when we've looked at some, and I've been out and done some work helping people, I think some of this is showing them what's possible. So if we were able to make X percent improvement, what would it take? And you just got to start analyzing the data. But I think that's a really hard thing to do you know, at the production line. It has to be, to me, the plant wants to make a transformation and the leader of that plan or that business. So I drive this in my business and try to find two things. How do I help my customers and how do I improve my business and how do we use data to do that? But I think to me it, it works, at least in my business, because I push it and I expect it. Any other questions? Yep. Sure. of data a day over here. How do, you, how do you make those choices? So, I, I think two ways. Um, so when we think, I, I think you, you really have to do two ways. Is you got to know what problem you're trying to solve. And you got to have some goal. And you know, one of the things I had here written up here at some point, I said, I didn't say it, but you know, she said this, you don't know what you don't know. Right? You don't know what you don't know. We always say that. I think you just have to let the data take you on the journey. So you're going to see something, and you're going to go, what is that? And what is that telling me? And then what can I do with it? I think the real question we need, we need to think about, and I take a little more optimistic approach to we don't know what we don't know, and I, I think we don't know what we can know. So there's no way to know, right? You've got to start out and say, I'm going to solve one problem. That's what we did. And within less than six months, we had 10 other directions we were heading. And, and I had to hold it back. It's like holding back a team of horses. I'm like, wait, wait a second, we can't do all of this. It just get, it explodes. And you could see the stuff like listening to her this morning, right, when she was showing some of those things, I thought, well, OK, there's some kind of a disease thing there. But what does that mean? And from other things I've read, you know, it could be the culture. It could be people that had moved from somewhere. And that's just natural. Like, you just don't know, right? Why is that? And you just say, OK, well, what, what's the next question? And I think you go back to that thing of data and insight, an action and an improvement. And you just, whatever that first insight you gain is, you follow that thread. And I think it just becomes an upward spiral of progress. But I, I honestly, when we started talking about corrosion, that's the reason I, I brought that example. So we solved lots of problems, but we started talking about it. I'm like, well, that's kind of huge. And where do you start? I mean, you can't solve it all tomorrow. So we picked, we literally just picked one thing. And then we started talking to customers. And the, the thing I've learned in digital, right, I was a, I've been a product guy for 10 years. And, and I was, I've been a general manager for the last three. And I, I built products. I built products forever. And I love it. But I built always hardware stuff. And it was like, it had to be great when it hit the market. You can't bring some mediocre product out there. But software is a totally different deal. You can, 
you got to know something good and you got to deliver something good, but you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to be absolutely right. You just have to be directionally correct and you got to be able to move really fast to the next value and adapt to what your customers are telling you. So it's kind of great from a product perspective because as long as you can kind of get that, you can get a, a nugget of value right away, you can start to grow. And I think solving problems with data, data is very similar to that. Yes? So in case of your sensor, taking the example of turbine uh, you know, that you're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> so the biggest challenge with analytics of, of you know, coming out of that sensor data is, is having data which represents a failure data set, right? Uh, because you, you got to compare it with something, right? Uh, in case of something which is an engine on, on a jet plane, how, you know, how would you go about building a failure data set for those? Well, it's not just about failure data sets. It's about how that engine performs. The reason that we outfit, now I, I don't know if I said this, that geared turbofan can generate in one, one engine in one 12 hour flight, can do like 800 terabytes of data. And Facebook with a billion users every day does like 500. So one 12 hour flight, staggering. Um, but they're learning how to analyze that data. The trick is the, the fail, when a failure happens, the beauty of it is you, you now know everything. So you can actually go back and gain insights and then use those insights to improve that thing in the future. Because the fact is, it's, you can start to see trends and you can take a guess, whether it's excess vibration or excess heat or some other thing. But there's really two things they're trying to do. One is extend the life of that engine, make it safer. And number two is gain any margin of efficiency you can gain. So can I run the high pressure turbine a little bit faster or can I run the combustor a little bit hotter? And does that give me anything additional? So it's really those two things. How do I make it more efficient? And how do I make sure I learn from, from any kind of failure? Or if, and when there is an event, you can go deconstruct it, which is meant to help make engines safer in the future. But you know, to be honest, I, I'm not, I know how we look at some things, and we pile that data, and you slice and you know. We, we do a lot of different visualizations and correlations and all of that. What they're doing, I, I, I don't know. They took a big bet on data there, and it's, it's a huge, huge amount of data. So I'm sure they're having to innovate how they actually analyze it. Yes? Just a simple question. Uh, relative to the amount of questions that you continue to answer based off of the insights you gain from interrogating the data, how many of those lead to nowhere that give you that insight into the one or two things that end up being your biggest innovations? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, what I would tell you is I think it's a little bit like um, you know, drilling for oil. You, get, you drill a lot of holes before you find any. Um, but when you find it, it's pretty valuable. Um, so, I mean, we, we've, we've looked at a lot of things. In fact, like in NDT, for example, um, and this is one of the reasons I think there's some opportunity here. So, I don't know an exact statistic, but we inspect things to see if something is wrong, whether there's a flaw in a pipe, or, and you can inspect it a whole bunch of ways. The real desire is that you you don't find anything. So probably 95% of everything we do um, re results in nothing. But the one time you find something, it's insanely valuable. So I, th I think you just keep mining. And the beauty of it is it's kind of free. Um, I mean, yeah, you're spending some time. But once you have all that data captured, the ability to just keep grinding through different analytics and combinations and permutations and what is this telling me and can I learn anything, um, it's nice. It's like digital pictures, you know. Do you remember the old days? Anybody <laughs> besides me? Um, when you actually used to have to take a picture and you were like all sensitive, like, oh my God, I only got three left, you know, and I got to be really careful. I don't want to waste any. And now we just take them like crazy because they're free. And, and I think data is a little bit like digital images. You can just take as many as you want and, and hopefully you snap the good one. Any final questions? All right, well, thank you again. Excellent presentation. Thank Very you. Thank you.